Okay. Um, I've been in NDP for the last three years that I've been here. I'm from Indianapolis. And what else? Okay, great. Uh, as, as a member of the New Directional Players for the past uh, three years, could you just speak to your involvement with uh, NDP? What has it done for you? What have you been able to share uh, with audiences and the like? Um, I think I've been able to share um, like a different side of me with audiences. Because like, even from my first play, when people really didn't even know who I was or whatever, they would still come up to me after saying, I didn't know you could get that loud and just all kind of different stuff that they saw on stage that I usually don't do in person or when they see me like on campus or whatever. Mm -hmm. So just showing people a different side of me and for myself, letting a different side of me come out. That different side of you for an actor, what does that mean? Some. Sometimes it's like a relief or like an escape. Because um, most times I'm usually just quiet and keep to myself a lot. But on stage I can't do that. And so it's just like being a different person, escaping from, I guess, my reality for a little while. Why do you act? Just to do that, to escape from my reality, to get my mind off of things that's going on in my life. Um, and it's just, I enjoy it. It's fun. Like rehearsals, meeting all the people, getting close to them, because we have so many rehearsals together, and just getting to know everybody. Of your years of experience in being in the New Directional Players, what would you consider a memorable moment for you, or a highlight for you, something that you discovered? Uh, what's that memorable moment? My, the first play we did, well, the first play I participated in, The Middle Passage, it was done my freshman year. Um, it was the first time I'd ever had a even semi big part, and I couldn't. I didn't even think I remember it, remember my lines, um, but I did, and it just. I just amazed myself because I didn't think I'd be able to do it, but Don told me I would, and I did it. So that would be it. Okay. What would you like to share with me in terms of uh, why I should? Uh bring the new directional players to my school, to my institution, to my organization, to my big corporate affair. Uh, what would you like to share? What lasting impression would you like to, to give, to leave me with? Where, um, I don't know, I just think we all are a group of talent. We all are talented in our own rights. Um, just, um, I don't know. I feel like we give, when we're doing our performances, we give our best, and you'll see that when we do that, and you remember that, and we're not trying to just get up on stage and just be there. We want to give our best all the time, and that's what we try to do. Define for me, in the audience, in one brief sentence, what the New Directional Players is. New Directional Players. Um, uh, I think so. Here you go. Okay. We're a group that allows its members to um, I just lost what I was about to say. Um, can pause. I think we're a group that touches people um, with our actions, the way we express ourselves on stage. All right, so that one brief sentence about new directional players is what? A group that touches people through our acting. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, let's look at 
Tony on page page one, actor number three, shade of black. And actor number one with Ransom. Okay. Actor number one, the Anthony on page two. This is just to read for now. Actress number two will be Aisha. Actress number three can be Joanne. And we'll stop there. That's enough to get us rolled. Okay? I don't I mean, we're not going to stop for the evening. We're going to stop there. Okay. My turn. You know what, you got me. Um, before the new directional players was it even thought of about being the new directional players uh, arrived uh, his name is Juan Lewis he is the principal of Durgan Elementary School and Juan is going to tell you what his special gift is related to the new directional players the BCC and the Performing Arts Ensemble. So just give your undivided attention to Principal Lou. It's quite an honor. It's quite an honor to, to be here to just to speak with you about uh, the history um, of the New Directional Players. Um, it it's, uh, sort of came about with a conversation I had uh, with uh, Derek uh, last week and he called my office to talk about the possibilities of ensembles coming to our schools and uh, any chance I get uh, an opportunity to talk about the New Directional Players, you know my claim to fame uh, is to tell the history of, of, of NDP and then how it all came about and like you I was a uh, sophomore, junior at Purdue, and uh, I was working as the custodian of the BCC. And so, uh, how many of you have been here when the old center was here before they <laughs> raised it? So most of you have seen this. So, so uh, I was on work study, and I worked for Mr. Zamora, and, and so my job was to come in and make sure the bathrooms and the floors and the places got take, were taken care of. And, uh, and I've always had an outside interest, because I was a theater major at Purdue. Uh, you know, I had a keen interest in black theater specifically. Uh, but once I got here at Purdue, I, I realized that really n that didn't exist. Uh, uh, and if you weren't invited to be really a part of the university department, you know, you had a hard time just coming in as a student uh, trying to carve a niche and get yourself established. So, uh, and I didn't realize that until I was a freshman here and I enrolled and I said, well, I'm going to be a theater major and then my career is going to be a, an artist and, and, you know, I was all gung-ho as a freshman uh, uh, coming right out of high school because I spent my entire high school career uh, in developing the theater interest. And so uh, I get here and there's nothing here for me. Uh, you know, I really wasn't invited to be in the Purdue Theater Department and I thought that was strange because they offered it as a course of study, but I was beginning to find out that if you didn't come in or if you weren't really recruited, that you weren't really going to fit in. And, and, and in 73, 74, 75, uh, that was a real struggle uh, for me uh, because I said, well, hey, I'm paying tuition and I'm taking your classes and you're making me do all this work, but yet, you know, I, I'm not really fitting in. And so uh, the BCC became that outlet to, to, to prove to the department that, hey, that I was a talent and that I had opportunity and given some training that we all have that potential. Uh, we don't know what our potential is until we have that opportunity uh, to be trained and then be in a position to do something with that training. Uh, and I was struggling getting that opportunity the traditional way, going through the traditional theater programs here at the university. Um, so uh, Mr. Zamora, I talked him into giving me an opportunity to be the student coordinator uh, for the drama club. At the time it was just the BCC drama club. And uh, I convinced him that rather than going out and bringing someone in professionally, just let me do it. You know, you don't have to pay or anything. 
You know, I'm a part of the theater department, and you know, I felt like I could do something given the opportunity, and that's what I was begging for. I just want an opportunity uh, to be able to to show what we can do given given that chance. And so, uh, it took Tony a, quite a while to think about that, but then finally he said, "Well, you know, he had nothing to lose," and uh, he said yes. And so. Uh, I got that opportunity to, to coordinate. Um, and one thing that is consistent as I look at this group, uh, it makes me think back then that the ensemble was pretty much this size, mostly the females and a handful of males. I could not get any black males interested in, in drama. Uh, I always had plenty of female volunteers, but no, no males. And, and so here I'm thinking about now, I said, wow, nothing has changed over 24 years. It's still being dominated by women. And that's not a problem, but, but I, it always made me curious to know, why couldn't uh, the black males be interested in drama? You know, what was the deal here you know, uh, with that concern? But, uh, but it, it, it started out um, that uh, given this opportunity, the whole notion of a new direction was in my mind. You know. Uh, and, and uh, my roommate, uh, who was a white male, uh, we were colleagues going through the undergraduate program together. I convinced him to say, hey, look, you, you work as my assistant, more or less, and <laughs> together we'll, we'll recruit and, and we'll have, we'll have, certainly we'll have some students that will surface uh, to, to, be the, to be this group. And, uh, and together, between him and I, you know, I said, look, this is going to be a new thing. We're going to bring... Uh, something that Purdue has never experienced or witnessed before. We're going to really bring black theater uh, to Purdue. And, and, and it was that uh, moment that this new direction, the new directional players, came of age. Uh, and uh, we wanted it to be a name that meant just that. That, you know, we weren't so much forgetting the old because in my tenure, from 73 up to the time that I got this opportunity, it was real sketchy about what the drama club w was really doing. And so, uh, coining it and giving it a name uh, such as this, uh, we felt was going to establish something that really hadn't ex been experienced here at Purdue, not only at the Black Culture Center, but just on campus in general. And uh, so, the name New Directional Players became alive. Uh, our first logo was an arrow heading in one direction, and another arrow coming in the opposite direction. With the force of the arrows meeting, well, obviously, the, the, the image was that that arrow was split into two new directions. And thus, the, the, the name and that, that simple image of, of this arrow being so powerful that it, would, it split right in half, and then the arrow bent, and it went into two different directions. And, and that image of the new directional players uh, was one of the first logos that uh, we put out on our, our uh, brochures and when we advertised ourselves as coming to see what was going to happen uh, at the BCC. Um, one of the strategies that we wanted to use that any performance that we did during that time period, we wanted it to be at the center. Um, we wanted black theater to be an experience for anyone who had the uh, curious, you know, if they were curious, if they just wanted it for self-pride. Uh, you know, we expected to see our audience to be dominated by uh, either the black students that were here at the time. Uh, but to our surprise, you know, we, we always seemed to have more white audience than we would have blacks participating. But that didn't care. That didn't bother me because we wanted, we wanted everyone to come on our turf. And we knew our turf was the center. And I didn't want to use the Hall of Music. I didn't want the Loeb Theater. I didn't want the Experimental Theater or the Fowler House. Uh, because it, it didn't quite represent us in the same way. You know, if you really wanted to know about black theater, you had to come to the BCC to get that experience. And you would have to come to the basement and you had that underground feel. And, and for people who really didn't come to the center, it was an experience. I mean, you come at night, it's dark, and all of a sudden you're asked to go down and we made sure that the hallways had a dim lighting. I mean, so, you know, we wanted this ambience of, of unsurety of, of anyone, because they didn't know what they were going to step into with this thing of what we were trying to say, what was the black theater experience at that time. And of course, coming out in the uh, early 70s, mid 70s, uh, the, 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 the struggle, which we still talk about today, was, was, at, the, was at its peak. Uh, playwrights at that time were really focused on the black experience. And, 
and really talking about the issues that, that we are still confronted with today, uh, but yet it was more it was more poignant. It was very direct. Uh, it, it puts you on the edge of your seat. Uh, you know, I don't know how many of you heard of uh, Leroy Jones or Ed Bullens or you know they were you know they were uh, the, what I consider the two most prolific writers that I enjoy working with uh, their their material because uh, they didn't they didn't cut any corners. You know, you had to have stomach as far as I was concerned to really. Uh, deal with their issues and, and how they made you feel. You know, now, for a black audience, that was fine. I mean, they understood. They could relate. But if you weren't part of that black experience, well, you know, you got a whole new different sensation about what these guys had to say or what the actor was saying to you because they were telling you something. And that was one thing that I uh, found fascinating with black playwrights is that not only was it entertaining, but there was always the message uh, that was to, for you to have, uh, for you to learn from. Not only was it to tell us and reflect about our own lives, but for those who wanted to know something about us, that was an avenue that they could learn. And uh, once they experienced that, uh, Purdue got very interested, uh, and when I say Purdue, I, I always separated Purdue and the BCC. I don't know why. I, I, you know, you know. Yes, we were part of Purdue. Oh, and and in my mind, um, there was Purdue, and then there was the BCC, and and and, and I still feel that way today. You know, twenty years later, uh, that you know, there's the BCC, and then there's Purdue, and so. The Purdue community, I felt, became uh, really interested in, in, in our performances. And, and once the students realized that uh, we were successful and that we packed the little basement of the BCC with, with a, a full house of people, that our, our, uh, the program seemed to just, just, just to go from there. Uh, we never had a performance where we didn't have a sellout. But we always did it in the basement, so you know, there was only 35, 40, 50 people. But, but it was a packed house, and, and we knew every time that we would advertise that we would draw uh, a large sector of the Purdue community to our, to our night shows. And, uh, uh, and what I see here uh, is, is really exciting because as a Purdue theater student, uh, Tony didn't have all this stuff that I wanted. You know, I said, Tony, I need lights, I, I, we need some curtains, we need to get some ex extension cords, we need, we, we need all these props and things for these things to happen. I said, if we're really going to have drama here, then we're gonna, we need to transform that basement. And uh, he didn't know how we were going to do that. He said, well, I don't have any real money, I don't have any budget. And so so as, a, as a theater student, you know, I took uh, advantage of my connections there and said, well, I need to borrow this and let me have some of these lights and uh, let me borrow this pipe. I need this curtain over here and, and some of these props. And, and so we, we called the big steal and borrow syndrome uh, to transform that basement in, in, into that live theater stage. And, uh, and I remember that little black platform that was in the corner of the basement. You know, that was our stage. You know, we would confine all of our blocking to that little corner there. And then we might span out across the front, and we'd tape it off, and we'd drape it, and so we'd set up a proscenium look for the people to come in, and then everyone would sit at a, at, in, a, in a boxed format with, with the chairs filling up the, in every space that we could get a chair in. Uh, so you took center stage in that little corner, and all the action uh, happened right there on that platform. And so the types of plays that we would focus on would involve one or two characters, uh, limited movement, limited... Uh, uh, action, limited props, uh, and pretty much what you're continuing today here. You, I noticed he talked about the, 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 the we're not going to have a lot of blocking. Uh, well, because it, it, you know you don't have to have a, a, you know a Broadway production in order to to do to do performance in order to perform. Uh, people were coming to see the actors. They they were coming to see you, uh, not all the props. You know the props sometimes are necessary. Uh, but but th that's the message wasn't in the prop. The message was from each of the students who decided to commit to, to, the, to that performance. And so uh, it's it's fun to know to, and to come back and share these uh, this little bit of history here. You know, that's like my claim to fame, uh, and uh, being able to uh, uh, share that with you and let and, and see that that NDP is still really doing. Uh, uh, very similar types of things that we started when I was had that opportunity 
uh, is quite exciting. You know, one dimension that I really wanted to say that, that, that I wanted the ensemble to do when I was working with it was to do more educational uh, concepts. Uh, I felt that there was two dimensions to the, to the program. Not only was it should be fun and entertaining, but there's an educational component. And that educational component would challenge students to understand uh, oral history, uh, black folklore, uh, and, and write original or adapt folklore that would be suited for children. Because throughout our schools, we have lots of black children that need uh, positive role models, positive interactions. And, and something that I wanted to do then was for, to challenge the students to, to think about, well, how would you write something? How would you write an original play that would be appropriate for kids that we could go into schools and do the same types of things that we're doing here with college level uh, age groups and, and adults? Uh, but we never got to that dimension. We got so wrapped up into the, the fun and the entertainment part that that dimension uh, took, took dominance. Uh, and so I'm, I'm coming back to challenge this group this year is to think about the importance of children in, in elementary school. Because I'm an elementary school principal. And, and, and theater plays a, a dominant role in, 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 in elementary education. We don't take advantage of it like we should. Uh, it teaches uh, reading, it teaches comprehension, uh, it, it, it teaches children how to develop <coughs> meaning from text. Uh, kids can take words and then begin to put their own experience to those words and, and now recreate a situation that becomes potent for that individual. And for that individual to, to be able to uh, communicate that to someone else gives them an opportunity to, to perform. And children love to perform, and they love to see performances. So if you ever want a challenge, look at some of the history and, and some of the uh, black ch uh, children literature writers that are out there. Ashley Bryant, uh, Ezra Jack Keats, uh, there's uh, uh, Patricia McKissick, uh, Vera Williams, um, um, you know, there's, 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 there's a host of, of, of black authors that are writing for children who have wonderful uh, folklore that could be easily adapted into original plays. And if, you're, if you are interested in, in doing that, you know, that would be a neat challenge for the ensemble to add that dimension uh, to your experience here. Not only are you here to, to have fun and entertain, but you're here to educate and to be role models uh, for our young children that are following in your footsteps. And uh, to be able, and being a small group, you know, it, it, it's a wonderful opportunity to get out there and see a, a, a lot of young kids, not specific, you know, specifically black children as, as well as all types of kids that who you can go out and, and share positive things about the black experience. And, and I'm finding out that, that we don't have out there. You know, I'm in a populated area here that has 7 or 8 percent black population. That's not a big population, but those kids are still there. And they don't have positive role models. They don't have anyone coming to them talking about these positive experiences. And they're, they're, they're getting, it, they're getting a, a, what I call the immersion of Western culture and, and, and Western history. Uh, we need to step up. I felt that way when I was a, a sophomore junior here uh, in 1974, 75, and this is 1999, and I still feel that way, that we have that responsibility uh, to understand what drama means, not only to entertain us, but how does it help us teach children what they need to, to know about themselves. And uh, I, I, I leave with you that challenge. Well, we would. Two of the uh, books uh, that I worked out of that year were these two right here, uh, the Black Quartet and the, uh, well, this is the Black Quartet, and this is the Black Drama Anthology. Mm -hmm. And th these were both 70, 71, 1970, 71, when they were uh, designed. And so uh, these are the, um, what I consider the real gripping uh, um, stories of, the, of that time period. And, uh, you know, uh, I'm not for sure Whatever, everyone's in here, freshmen, sophomores, juniors? Seniors. Seniors. <laughs> All right, nope, my apologies. So, uh, well, um, so uh, getting an opportunity to, to find these and, uh, would be uh, 
um, would give you a sense of, uh, of, of the energy and the intensity of which uh, black playwrights wrote. Uh, you know, uh, we had to streamline some of the content uh, because you know, even I was, even at that time, was unsure. I said, wow, are we going to be able to really deal with this? I mean, you know, and I didn't want to put Mr. Zamora at a disadvantage, uh, but yet I didn't want to water it down so much to where it lost its meaning. And, and when we took those risks, uh, I didn't care after a while. I said, well, hey, you know, this is what this is all about. This is, you know, the people who have put us in this situation. You know, if you're uneasy, hey, I couldn't help that because this was life. This was, you know, these are real experience here. Even though the characters are fictitious, uh, playwrights were writing from, from, that, from the black struggle and the black experience. And it put us on edge. I mean, uh, so those who, who weren't directly connected to that, uh, yeah, they, they would feel uneasy. And, and, and I decided at that time that, look, you know, if, if, if they couldn't handle it, then you got up and walked out. And we had people who did that. We had, you know, there were whites that, you know, got edgy and, and they would just quietly get up and they left. But I, I didn't care about that because that wasn't the message. I mean, those that could stomach it and then those that felt the pride from it, they hung out and, and really enjoyed it and, and wanted more. Uh, and so uh, uh, these things, these types of things challenge you. You know, now how these play in today's time, you might say, well, this isn't even relevant anymore. But, you know, you have to realize that this was 1970, 1971, um, when, you know, when adults then, uh, who are my age now, you know, my age, you know, they were 35, 40 when I'm 19, 20, uh, you know, this was their energy and their intensity from, from their frustrations uh, living in, in, in America. Think about the new center. <laughs> what do you think about the new center? Oh, the new center? Oh, this, this was the vision. You know, I was up here, I just been marking at these lights up here because, well, you know how the basement was. The basement. <laughs> <laughs> you can jump up and take a bed. You like know, I mean, we have to have some really sharp I'm still coming. We set in type of lights. And so, uh, I really think uh, this was, you know, all the work that Tony and the foundation that he had laid uh, and, and, and just the, the work of the ensemble group, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, this was built for you guys, uh, and uh, you know, uh, I, I'm just glad to see it because it, it, you know, I've had a lot of flashbacks here since I've been here, uh, thinking about uh, that time <coughs> period and and just uh, how things evolved. It has taken it 25 years to happen, but I think the whole goal has been for something like this to happen, and, uh, and I'm just glad to be a part of that history. Would you, uh, young lady, would you simply please identify yourself? My name is Aisha Washington. I'm from Indianapolis, Indiana. I'm a senior in computer technology. Great, great. Uh, and I understand that you are a member of one of the ensembles at the Black Cultural Center. Yes, I am. I'm the student coordinator for New Directional Players, and um, some of my duties or tasks or what have you is to facilitate between the ensemble itself along with the uh, uh, artist in resident and the uh, uh, assistant director of the Black Culture Center, and it may include me to send out emails of our uh, rehearsal schedule, um, send out flyers of our production, or get costumes, uh, run off copies of our plays, or I may have to actually go to the library to get a play that we are doing scene study work on. So that's basically what my job is. I heard you mention something about an artist in residence. Would you speak to us about what an artist in residence is, and particularly that which is about new directional players? Well, the artist in residence is Don Burris. Our artist in residence is Don Burris, and he's the one who leads our master class. He, uh, when we actually have a play, he's the one who casts the play, do the blocking for the play. So he's the one who really guides us, like the the vehicle of NDP to get our performances. I understand that you have been a member of the New Directional Players for several years yeah. uh, now. And would you just share with us uh, what you consider to be a memorable moment for you as an actress of the New Directional Players? My most memorable moment would be my third semester of actually being a member of NDP. And uh, we did a play called Spunk. And it was just breathtaking. Being a freshman, you know, working with upperclassmen, they kind of just 
like grab me and nurture me and they just show me the ropes and this is how you should do it as acting and this is what is going to be required of you and we put on a fabulous play um, we stand up real late rehearsing the lines uh, during the tech rehearsal just just being there and that's just being my first play was just phenomenal because I just got so many good reviews about it, good comments about my acting capabilities and just the play itself. So I guess, yeah, that is my most memorable moment since then. That's what led me to continue being an active member of New Directional Players.